you know, we get asked all the time, who are your listeners? Who subscribes to your podcast? You know, how many do you have? So I thought you may be curious. We, at our peak month, which was uh, June of 2018, just last month as I'm recording this, we got 242,000 listens. So the podcast has been growing, doing really well. We're close to uh, approximately 600 podcasts that have been done. Not all by me, thank God, but many of them have been. I wanted to know something. Um, who are you, listeners? We, uh, from the data that we've seen, there's a lot of early adopters, uh, people that are you know anywhere from like 30 to uh, 55 that are interested in tech and all the new stuff that's coming out. But that may not be accurate. So I wanted to ask you, if you wouldn't mind, can you send an email to support at Future Tech Podcast? And let us know a little bit about yourself. You don't have to tell us your name or any of that stuff, but if you just let us know, why do you listen to the podcast? What do you get out of it? What some of your favorite episodes have been? And what do you want to see more of and hear more of in the podcast? And I'd love to accommodate you. And I'd love your feedback. So again, please send an email to support at futuretechpodcast.com. And thanks for listening. Welcome to Almost Here, Round the Corner of Future Technology Podcasts with Richard Jacobs. Future Technologies, poised to transform our lives for better or worse, are the focus of this podcast. Almost Here means these technologies are now here and starting to be used. We're just around the corner, from Bitcoin to artificial intelligence, 3D printing, blockchain, virtual reality, and more. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech Podcast. My guest today is Dr. Corey Kidd of Catalia Health. Uh, Dr. Kidd, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. So tell me about uh, Catalia and your work there. What are you working on? Certainly. So Catalia Health is a chronic disease care management company. We help patients across a variety of different conditions. And of course, the concept is not new. We see that at scale right now. Uh, but largely the you know, home-based programs or call center-based programs, we have definitely a different take on how we do it. We actually give our patients a cute little robot that sits in the home. It's about a foot and a half tall, sits on a kitchen counter or bedside table or wherever someone wants to put it, and talks to them. So it's actually creating a conversation on the fly for that person at that point in time that's really tailored to their particular needs. Now, on the back end, the data that we're getting from them is going back to the doctor or the nurse or the pharmacy so that those people can continue to provide high-quality follow-up care to their patients. So... uh... Any particular diseases or just ones that are chronic or ones that are uh, terminal or just debilitating? How do you choose when uh, a robot will be suitable? So we focus broadly on chronic diseases, so things where people are going to need help over a long period of time. Our first product that's out on the market is for patients who are dealing with heart failure. Uh, We've got things coming out later this year for patients with rheumatoid arthritis, one, uh, one application for people dealing with late stage kidney cancer, and there are a few others in the works. So we work with healthcare systems or with pharmaceutical manufacturers and develop programs around needs that they have in terms of scaling patient care. So why uh, why a robot? What uh, you know? How does it interact with the patient, and uh, what what do you want them to get out of it? Well, I'll I'll answer the second part first in terms of how it interacts, and then I'll talk about the why we use this uh, this form factor. So if you go to our website, CataliaHealth.com, you can see a, a picture or a video of this to get a sense of what it looks like, but designed to be, you know, fairly small and cute. And the interaction is simply conversation, so talking back and forth with it. Now, it does have eyes. It can look at you and make eye contact. And this leads into the, the why a robot? Why are we not doing this on uh, an app on your smartphone or tablet or through your TV or web browser? And, you know, a lot of us, in healthcare and business, spend a lot of time face to face with other people. You know, I know I spend a ton of my time on the road traveling, meeting with our partners and customers and investors. And you know, the reason that all of us do that is we get intuitively that face to face is different, right? We get a different feeling when we're talking to someone in person versus over the phone or definitely, you know, email or text messaging. And from a psychological standpoint, we actually understand a bit about what those differences are. When we're face-to-face with someone, we're more engaged uh, in the conversation. We create a stronger relationship, and there are a number of other differences. And as it turns out, work that I started doing more than 15 years ago showed that those differences carry over into the world of technology. In other words, you put something like this robot there that can literally look you in the eyes while it's talking to you. 
we get those effects, the psychological effects of face-to-face -face interaction. And mm -hmm. where that really makes a difference is in terms of long-term engagement. And that's one of our big challenges today in managing chronic disease. These are things that you know, we deal with in our everyday lives. Maybe we need to you know, measure our blood pressure or weight or take a pill or you know, do my rehab exercises or whatever it might be. And doing that for a few days is not really much of a problem for most people. A few weeks gets a little more challenging. We start talking about months or years. That's really tough for almost everyone. Mm -hmm. And so what we're doing here is building something that's really helpful in supporting people to manage those conditions over longer periods of time. So what kind of interactions do people have with the robots? Do they, uh, you know, do the robots have AI or they just have a set number of phrases they can, they can answer with? So the core of our technology is a set of artificial intelligence algorithms that are really drawing on psychology to build a conversation. So it's not a script. It's not a set number of things that this is reading from. You know, a conversation might start off with, oh, good afternoon. How are you doing? And based on that person's answer can go off in many different directions. Now, it's always going to be around a particular set of topics. You know, take our heart failure product. It'll know a lot about the types of medications that patient might be taking. Uh, you know, be able to talk about the challenges of a low-sodium diet and, you know, some of the other behavioral changes that, uh, that our patients need to make and a set of things around that. But what it's doing is learning about that individual, understanding where they are in their treatment journey. You know, have they just been diagnosed? Have they been dealing with this for years? What are the issues that are going on, you know, today or in the last few days that they can talk about? And really tailor that conversation to that person's needs at that point in time. And the last thing it's trying to do is understand that person's personality. You know, how are we going to adapt to the way that I want to have this information delivered to me? So much like a doctor or a nurse that we think of as having, you know, good bedside manner, they're always going to tell us the right thing medically, but they're going to tailor that conversation. They're going to adapt it to my personality and try to talk to me in the best way possible. And so we try to do the same thing through our robot, which we call Maybu. So what kinds of things, uh, I don't know if you see what the, uh, the patients are saying to the robots, but what, what do the patients tell you that they're talking to the robots about? Or I don't know if you're saving the data or if you can see anecdotally, like what's happening and why is this helping them? What do they talk to the, the bots about? So, you know, again, we, it's not open-ended conversation. So in other words, the, the conversations are always going to be around a certain set of topics. And, and so what that means is, you know, when a, if I'm a patient talking to Maybu, I can't just say anything and everything. When she says something or asks a question, you know, there, there is a limited number of responses that, that I can reply to her with. But we, what we are doing is learning from those about what patients are, are interested in, what uh, kind of topic areas and directions they like to take the conversation so that we're able to you know, respond to them when we can and understand where we need to build additional information or content or have a person follow up. Now, the goal here is not to you know, completely replace the people who are providing care, but it's to be able to you know, overall provide a good experience for that patient. And sometimes that means, hey, do you want me to have a nurse call you and follow up with a question that, that I can't answer? Well, what are, yeah, what are some examples of um, things maybe that surprised you or interactions that you thought were really useful that helped patients? So one thing that we've seen is, you know, managing the, some diseases can be quite complex. You know, let's, uh, we we're talking about heart failure. So that's a good example where when someone is first diagnosed, there are a lot of changes that happen right away. Right? Suddenly I go from, you know, maybe being on no medications or just a handful to now suddenly I'm on five or ten different drugs and I've got to change my diet and my lifestyle. And part of the challenge here is just the number of changes and, you know, the ability then for Mebu to educate patients on those topics. So to be able to do that kind of follow up. So, you know, that's an example of a type of conversation that is you know, relatively simple and straightforward in terms of any one particular piece of content, but making that available to the patient, you know, on their schedule, be able to talk to it when they want to is something that's very valuable and that, that we've seen our patients really like. Does the robot remind them to take their medications? It certainly can. That's one feature that uh, that it offers to every patient who is using it. Uh, what we see is most patients do prefer to have that reminder, and that can happen either 
through the robot herself. You know, you can say, uh, I take this at 8 a.m. every day, wake up and remind me. Uh, if I know I'm not generally home at that time, she can send a text message reminder. So we've got a few ways that we interact with patients. You know, the robot's there for the reasons we were talking about a minute ago in terms of building that relationship, but that doesn't mean every interaction has to happen through there. Yeah, and then think about that. So the robot doesn't have to go with you. It can sit at home and it can text you back and forth or it can interact in other ways. Exactly. Yeah. Huh. So, you know, it's, we see many of our patients having the majority of the conversations through the robot, but that does not have to be the only way that they interact with her. Well, what are some other ways? Is texting anything else that, I, that comes to mind? Right now, it's, uh, it's either in person or with texting. Uh, we'll be enabling automated uh, phone calls in the future as well. Oh, so the, the bot would call you and, again, say, take your medication, that kind of thing? Exactly. And you said the bot might be might have the capability to communicate with nurses. Can you can you dedicate certain people? You know, let's say you're in trouble, and you normally call I don't know nine one one. Can the bot do it, or can the bot notify X number of your family members that something's going on if you tell it to? So that's not something that we do at the moment. So you know what we do as a company, we are not selling directly to patients. And one of the advantages of that for patients is that they are not paying for this. We work with healthcare systems or the pharmaceutical manufacturers. So if a healthcare system is offering this to their patients, we're already integrated with them. So we're able to send information back to the doctors or nurses. So for example, if a patient uh, requests a call or a follow-up from a clinician, we already know who their nurse is, and it's set up for that information to go back to them. Mm, okay, I see what you mean. So the um, the healthcare networks, uh, insurance companies, et cetera, what features do they like about it, and why do they find it valuable? Why do they decide to take it on? So when we're working with healthcare systems, you know, in, in heart failure, for example, one of the areas that they are all currently focused on is how do they help to reduce readmissions to the hospital after a discharge? You know, so if a patient is admitted to the hospital with a certain condition, treated and sent home, you know, right now, one of the challenges is how do you provide that follow-up care? You know, the end of treatment is not when a patient leaves the hospital with a chronic condition. They're going to be, you know, continuing to do something typically on a daily basis for a long period of time. And, you know, there's a challenge today in how we scale that care and provide that care to patients on an ongoing basis. And that's what they're interested in. That's really what we're helping with in terms of providing this kind of technology interface to help them better do that. Yeah, it makes sense because the nature of something being chronic means that, you know, a, a large percentage of the population will be, will be readmitted X number of times over the course of the, the disease. Exactly, and that's that's one of our, our challenges, broadly speaking, in healthcare today. Is as you know, on the positive side, as we live longer, you know, as medicine has advanced and helped us to to live into you know decades that very few people saw, say, a century ago. It does mean that many more of us are dealing with these chronic, ongoing challenges on an everyday basis. So anything that we can do to help to support these people and you know let them live happier and healthier lives is a, a positive to everyone. So what are, um, I know it depends on the condition, but in general, what are the reasons for uh, people having to go back to the doctor or go back into the hospital, be readmitted? What are the failings that you think well, this will help? You know, if we look overall at the challenges of, manic, uh, of managing a chronic condition, there are a bunch of different ones, but they, for the most part, fall into three categories. One is around symptoms of the disease, you know, the, and that could go in both directions. Obviously, in most diseases, there are symptoms that are bad and have negative effects, and, you know, we, we need to know how to deal with those, what we should be doing, what's normal, what's not, you know, when do I need to, to follow up with someone. Uh, and it could go the other direction as well. One of the challenges that we have for certain patient populations is, oh, yeah, I'm feeling pretty good this week or this month. I don't need to take that medication. Mm. <laughs> but that, that doesn't necessarily have good long-term effects. Um, so, Makes you know, sense. symptoms is number one. Second is uh, side effects. Right? Most treatments, unfortunately, do have some side effects for some portion of the population. How do we better manage those? When do we... You know, help a patient know when it's the right time to call the doctor or nurse, or is this something that's normal and common, and what can I do to deal with it? Uh, and then the third set of things are the psychosocial issues. 
so when we're talking about chronic conditions, you know, there's big challenges with managing things like anxiety and stress and depression. And unfortunately, these things are you know, fairly normal for people who are dealing with these kinds of conditions. And so how do we, one, help them deal with it, but across all of these things, whether it's something like depression or you know, the symptoms of the disease, the side effects of a medication, how do we alert their caregiver that something is happening? Instead of waiting until their next follow-up visit to their doctor a month or two out, mm. we can let them know right away so that they know which patients they can follow up with and provide the care they would like to be able to do today if only they knew this was happening. So uh, do you have any stats yet on uh, you know number of readmissions going down or uh, better control of symptoms or people lasting longer you know, with a certain condition before they, you know, they pass away? So, yeah, I think we're, we're still quite a ways off from being able to have that level of data. You know, the versions of this have been in development for a very long time now. The first time I put these in front of patients was a dozen years ago. Huh. <laughs> Italia Health, though, is a fairly new company. We're about three and a half years old, and we actually just started shipping to our first patients earlier this year. So it's a very exciting time for us in that, you know, the early indications that we're getting back in terms of feedback from patients and the data that we're seeing is very positive. Uh, but as you know, you know, building things in healthcare and getting that kind of evidence can mm. take uh, an extended period of time to, to get there. Definitely, yeah. So what, what kind of feedback are you getting? Is it surprising or is it uh, what you expected? And what, what are some uh, feedback you've gotten that was, again, interesting to you or you thought you really liked? I'll tell you a quick story from the first randomized controlled trial 11 years ago. <laughs> we put these out in patients' homes. You know, they didn't know what they were getting in advance, and it was a randomized trial. So some of them got these robots, some of them got other systems and things to help, uh, you know, stick with the treatment. And a couple months later, you know, we make calls to the patients to go back and pick these up. And we had three groups. One of them had uh, what's often still today's standard of care, the paper log, you know, write down what you're doing every day and, uh, and bring this back in your next appointment. We had another group that had a, a computer and it was running the same software as the robots were at the time. So had the ability to adapt to the conversation. And, you know, at the end of the study, they were done. Actually, most of them didn't even make it to the end. They were happy to give it back to us. And then we had the group of people who had the robots. And, you know, we started making calls to them. And as soon as we got them on the phone, they started trying to negotiate. Oh, can I keep her just a couple more weeks? You know, she's really like a friend or, you know, she's like, remember my family, how about one more month? And, you know, it turned out that one of the challenges of that study was just getting these back in the end. And, you know, we'd walk into patients' homes to, to pick these up and interview them. And it wasn't just that plain robot sitting there. They were dressed up, hats. Stars. Huh. <laughs> you know, one of them was wearing a red feather boa. Really? Every single person had named their robot. You know, so these things that we knew theoretically should work from earlier, you know, psychology-based studies in this interaction really held true when we put these out in the real world. And that version of it, again, more than a decade ago, was was simpler than what we have now. So we have a lot more conversational capability topics that it can talk about today uh, than we did then. But even with that version, the response was extremely strong in terms of patients liking these and wanting to talk to them. Huh. Very, very cool. Interesting. I guess sad. You were like robot protective services, removing them from the home. <laughs> <laughs> it was a very sad day for many people, yes. <laughs> so where are you at now? How many um, uh, you know, do patients have these robots again? You know, now that it's been so long and how many have them and what kind of data are you getting now? Yes, yeah, it's a fairly small number since we just started shipping to our first commercial patients a few months ago. Uh, we're in the process of rolling these out this year through additional healthcare systems and pharmacies. So the numbers will continue to go up. Uh, you know, if you do have any listeners who are, you know, dealing with heart failure or have a loved one who is and want to try one out. We're also shipping these out at no cost to patients who are willing to give us feedback. And mm. there's a website, mymabu.com, M-Y-M-A-B-U.com, and people can go there and uh, connect with us if they want to learn more about that program. Very interesting. So what's, what's the next uh, few steps for you? How long is this trial going to go well, on and what's next? <clears throat> So the, the trials will be indefinite. <laughs> you know, we're okay. always going to be learning more and more 
uh, about how to improve the product. So we will always be doing things like that. Uh, but we will be rolling out with additional healthcare systems uh, throughout the next few years. So these will be available to more patients, you know, connected to their existing doctors and nurses. We will have products out with a few drugs this fall, so patients who are on certain uh, oncology drugs or arthritis, you know, immunologic drugs will start to be offered these uh, starting before the end of this year. And so what we're doing as a company is constantly looking at, you know, building additional features and content for the types of diseases that we're dealing with today, but also building out uh, content to help deal with other diseases. You know, ultimately, we want to be able to help patients regardless of what the condition that they're dealing with is, because we've seen that this is an interface and a technology that can be really successful at creating that long-term ability to manage a disease. Hmm. Okay, very good. So the best way is uh, for listeners to go to what my Maybu, or are there are other ways to get in contact and uh, find out more info. So if you want to sign up for that uh, pilot program, mymaybu.com is the best way to do it. Uh, if you have general information, you know, looking for general information about the company, you can find me on Twitter at Corey K, C-O-R-Y-K. Uh, also fairly easy to find on uh, LinkedIn or at our company website, kataliahealth.com. Yeah, one, one last question I want to ask. What, what other conditions are you going to be moving into or is heart failure plenty for the near, near-term future? Like, I guess the diabetes would be a, you know, a chronic condition that people would need help over a long period of time, maybe the field's too crowded, I don't know. Absolutely, so I actually did the first version of this, the study that I was talking about a few minutes ago in diabetes and weight management. Uh, you know, As we've discussed, heart failure is the first product that we have on the market. Uh, we will have things coming out this year for rheumatoid arthritis, for late stage kidney cancer. And everything that we do is really market driven. In other words, we look for healthcare systems or pharmaceutical companies that have a need, and we work uh, then to develop the applications for that patient population. So, you know, if you've got listeners who are in a position where they are looking for solutions like this for patients, we'd love to talk with them as well. Okay. Well, very good. Well, Dr. Kidd, I appreciate your time and thanks for coming on the podcast. Thanks so much for having me. You have been listening to Almost Here. Around the Corner Future Technology Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Subscribe to this podcast, post a review, to discover more future technologies that are poised to transform our lives for better or worse, such as Bitcoin, artificial intelligence, 3D printing, blockchain, virtual reality, and more.